Hey guys. Well, I hope you didn't have too much of a big lunch because I'm gonna talk for one hour about bill files. Uh, <laughs> uh, just so I know, i uh, like to get a better feel of my audience. Uh, who here likes to write bill files? <laughs> okay, uh, let, let, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Uh, then, who likes to write especially CMake list files? Okay, F for those watching on YouTube, that was almost everybody. <laughs> All right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a pain. Uh, we usually think that it could be uh, delegated to somebody else. Uh, I mean, for, for some of, of my time, or maybe not me, because I'm, I'm like very super into uh, make files and build system, maybe too much. But for most people, I guess, if your manager came to you and told you, I have a way that, I don't know, this external company or this guy down the hall is gonna write all your build files for the rest of your life, they would say, okay, great, great, great. Uh, so yeah, uh, for most of us, it, it's a problem. Uh, it's, like, it, it's like a hassle, it's something that we would like to uh, not do. But, well, I started working with that uh, for, for, for some years and I discovered that actually it can have some purpose. Um, for example, did you ever start with like uh, a small application you built where the, the dependency graph looked like this? Well, it's very simple. Uh, you have four libs and uh, a, a simple diamond pattern. You let that live and after, I don't know, a few months, years, you get something like that. Sounds familiar so far? All right. <laughs> yeah, uh, that happens to me too. Um, so, what are we gonna talk about today? We are going to see uh, what's, what's the idea between uh, the theory behind modular design, the idea that you should keep a clean uh, graph dependency and a, a clear code architecture, and how we can uh, integrate CMake into that. Well, technically speaking, any build system uh, worth its salt should be able to uh, allow you to use some patterns that will give you the same results. Uh, I, I'm just gonna use CMake because that's what everybody else uh, uses on, uh, if I trust GitHub or, or any uh, open source project, uh, really. But really th think of that as, a, as just an illustration. Uh, any build system should be able to, to provide you with the same thing. And in, in fact, most of what I will tell you today is taken from other build systems, some that are usually consider, considered more modern, that you also can have simply with CMake without the, uh, well, the big pain of changing entirely your, your build system. A few words about me. Uh, I'm uh, Mathieu, uh, I'm from France. You might have heard it already. Uh, I work at Murex, uh, and since one year I've been a contributor to Conan, and all I got for my pain was this lousy T-shirt. Uh, and, well, along the way I discovered a few things about CMake, uh, about packaging, and about how do we use all that to make uh, better code. So let's talk a bit about CMake. Uh, first thing that most people think is that CMake is a build system. Well, it's not. Technically speaking, uh, it's a build system generator. You tell him that you want to uh, build a project and all it does is generate the build file for somebody else. Uh, make, Ninja on, on Unix, uh, Visual Studio or something else on, on Windows. Uh, it just does that. It does not build by itself. It's just a, a meta description for uh, the generator you use. It's, well, uh, almost 20 years old now, and it's used in a lot of uh, open source projects. Uh, you might uh, recognize a few, and that's not limited to open source. Uh, private company also use uh, CMake uh, internally. And so, uh, what, what's the, the, big, the big deal with CMake? Uh, well, basically, it's maybe not the best, but it's the less painful solution we have to uh, handle uh, portability in C++, because the language can be portable, your libraries can be portable, if your build system is not, if you have to write, like, again, your build files for every system, you're not portable. And, and what CMake does is that you can finally write the thing once and have it work everywhere. And as we all know, it was a big success. For example, if you want to invoke it on a, on a Windows machine, that's how you do it, and on a Unix machine, that's how you do it. All right, I, almost portable, I would say, but we're not so far. 
So what, what do I call modern CMake? You might, you might have seen that uh, that was the title of my talk. I'm not entirely fond of the title myself, but you know, there's modern C++, why not modern CMake? Uh, it's something that's been available for some time. Uh, the first, uh, I would say, first compatible release would be 2.8.12. Uh, but in practice, a few months after that, they moved to the new 3.0 release, which has a few more features, but exactly the same philosophy. And it's very important to note that it's 2.8.12, because it's not a patch release. They changed that in the new free uh, branch, but in the branch 2, uh, the last one was also a feature uh, release. It's not semantic versioning. So when I say 2.8.0 and 2.8.12, there is like a huge array of features that you're missing uh, between the first and the last revision. So how do I know that any project I open on GitHub is not using modern CMake? Well, that's easy. I just have to look at the top line of your project and I see require 2.8. None of the features are guaranteed to be available. Even more than that, if you can have them because you have a more recent CMake, CMake may disable them because he wants to be compatible. That's what you are telling him. And that's how, uh, well, yeah, that makes me sad because you're missing out. Uh, let me explain exactly what you're missing. What you're missing is the opportunity to have uh, your uh, build system help you uh, do a better design. Uh, but before I explain that, let me go back to what I call modular design. The idea was uh, taken from uh, John uh, Lakos' talk that I had the privilege to watch last year, a uh, three-part talk, very interesting, uh, like a uh, one million slide in three hours. Uh, it, it comes from his book, uh, which is about the same length, uh, I think, like 1,000 pages. Uh, and I will try to summarize what, I, what I've taken from that uh, for, for this purpose. So obviously it will not be everything because that's like a huge topic. And John, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna make mistakes, I'm gonna forget something. But the idea is there, I hope so. So to explain modular design, I think the best idea is to take a simple example. Imagine for a second that you join uh, a small startup. There's like maybe two or three developers and you have this big idea that you are gonna uh, provide a service to compare uh, and find the best uh, taxi ride in your, uh, in your region. So uh, you, you have this first, uh, first iteration, you have to deliver a minimal project, uh, product just to demonstrate your, uh, your nice algorithm to your investors and obviously get some money and get funded for the rest. So if you try to apply some, uh, some kind of uh, model or design rules, you try to keep concerns separated. So we'll have a first, uh, a first library that will handle the, the taxi prices, the, the, the description of your objects and a few operators to manipulate them, maybe make sums or comparison, whatever. You will have a second one that we'll use to uh, describe a client order, like uh, where, what's his name, what's his profile, where does he come from, uh, where does he wanna go, that kind of stuff. And the final is the fare, which is the result. That's, that's just a very schematic example. But the idea is that to build your, your calculator, you actually depend on three modules which are completely independent and that you can test even without your super, uh, your super nice algorithm. That's, that's the point. So th that part, usually we get it right because it's like four uh, libraries and we are like two developers. Uh, some time passes. You, you see your, your investors, they are very happy, and they say, all right, go, go, go for it, go for it. De develop me a full service now. The proof of concept was okay, here is your funding. Okay, so you have to take to the rest, to talk to the rest of the world. So first you write some kind of a JSON parser that's able to retrieve the, the prices from all the companies in your area. Okay, then you want to serialize your clients, uh, your clients' uh, orders, so you had some uh, SQL database. Uh, and uh, you had a library to do the serializing. Note that uh, at each time, we decouple the problem. First, we have the de with technical dependency on the JSON, on the SQL library. I still have the class that represents my, uh, my object, and then I have one library that combines both. The idea is that I can still work with them in isolation. If tomorrow I decide that SQL is not the future, that it's no SQL, or that it's whatever, I can change that with no impact on the algorithm, on, on, on what it's making my company money. 
And of course, uh, we, find, we finish with uh, an over-serializer for the output of our algorithm in JSON. Okay, we, we're still fine, we have followed the practices. Again, we're still a small startup, that, that's fine. Okay, we, we scale up even more, uh, our clients are very satisfied, we can finally uh, put all that in one nice service. So we had a dependency uh, on the REST server library, uh, which itself is using some HTTP library, and we create uh, at the top the, the, the simple router that takes uh, a request, uh, check the prices, and gives you a JSON response with the best price you can get for what you ask. With me so far? Okay, that's a theoretical example. That's maybe what you might have seen in, a, in some classes. But then there's practice. And in practice, well, it might look more like this. You had some um, dependency that are kind of dubious uh, because you had to, maybe you were in a rush, or maybe you just didn't notice it. It, it just went through a code review, or you were tired. Well, we have lots of excuses, or I guess we give ourselves lots of excuses. <laughs> Uh, anyway, in practice, you are, your code is not uh, like this because you have circular dependencies, so in practice, you are, your two modules are only one here and one there. So directly, if you start looking at your graph, it's not that good. You start to have a mix of concerns, things that are not really uh, in the same uh, domain, that are bundled in the same library, and you cannot already test one without the other. So, well, it's starting to get messy, but you can still uh, test most of it. But in practice, if you let that pattern go and go and go, you, uh, you end up with something like this, which is one big blob, which is your service, and then maybe a few external libraries, and if you're unlucky, you may have even circular dependencies between your third-party libraries or the things that you consider really technical. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Okay, all right. <laughs> you were silent. I, I had a doubt for a moment. Like, like oh, is that only me? All right. Now, now, uh, uh, now I'm convinced. All right. So, what, what's the idea? The basic idea between mod behind modular design is just that you you keep control of your dependency graph. You make sure that when a library needs another library, it's explicit, and it can be checked by some kind of tool or reviewer to ensure that you are not creating a, a monster. That you are not. Uh, going through a huge monolith uh, with circular dependency with nothing you can reuse or test uh, in an isolated uh, way. And of course, without so much cost. Uh, in this example, you cannot reuse anything of your nice algorithm uh, without the whole stack. Uh, in this one, it's still possible, and the further we go, the better. And then there are modern build systems. They came back, well, I'm not sure which one I would, uh, I would call the first one. Um, what we, we might have heard about uh, Basil at Google or uh, the, the other clones that came up afterwards like Puck or Pants, whatever. Uh, they all have the same philosophy behind them is that they are very explicit in what you say. Uh, you are really explicit about what you ask to, uh, in, in terms of build. You, you, only, uh, you only ask for what you use and the system will forbid you to use something that you did not declare. And, and that's the key. If you do not declare something but you can use it, you will have a problem. Because it will slip through at some point. And that's exactly the idea of a modern build system. It's that uh, it protects you against bad patterns and it helps you uh, leverage on that to make sure that you keep uh, a clean architecture. Uh, so, if you come back to CMake, uh, what, what, what will happen? What happens today in most projects, in, in what I call, well, not so modern CMake? Uh, if I try to, to build, like, I don't know, a, a small project with just a TCP client and its own TCP library. It's very simple, two, two, two libraries and one, well, one library, one executable. That's it. Well, what do you think of that? Does this sound like something you might have seen or, or even written? Seems okay. Uh, well, first thing, I, I had a subdirectory, which is my, my, uh, my, my library. I declare an executable. Uh, I add the necessary include directory, possibly some flags if I need, uh, like, uh, IPv6 in that case. And then I tell CMake that my uh, binary depends on the library. 
And the problem with that, uh, sorry, the problem with that is that I'm not, uh, I'm not expressing myself in some of modules here. I'm not saying CMake, I have this, uh, I have this binary, it needs this library. I'm telling CMake, I have this binary, it needs those headers, it needs those flags, and then it needs to link to that. I'm not talking about modules, I'm talking about build flags. And there is, there is a world behind, uh, beyond those two. Uh, you, can, you can miss a lot of things and it doesn't scale. Uh, if, if I build up on my TCP library for another project, and I want then, I don't know, uh, an HTTP library and then a REST library. What will happen to my build flags? Well, TCP is quite clean. I just have minus I TCP and minus D IPv6. Then I do the lib HTTP. I have to copy paste those flags plus uh, the flags for the, uh, for the library itself. And then again, same thing uh, for the, the, the library just up ahead. And it doesn't scale. Every time you have a public dependency, that means that you would have to take all the public flags from the library you're using and copy them in your CMake list. And if you go to like three, four, five iteration, you end up with like, I don't know, three lines of, uh, of flags that you have to add to your library or to your program to be able to compile. That, that's what I, 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 I'm afraid, that's what I see in some projects. And what do you do usually? you just give up because it's just a nightmare to maintain. If you have to change the library that's at the root, you have to modify everything in your system. So what do you do? You go to the top, CMake file, and you say, all right, everybody can include that directory. Everybody can link to that dub. And that's the only sane way you can, well, that's the only sane way you, you might think you can do it. And I won't blame you for that. I did the same thing. And the idea is that CMake has another way, and most build systems have another way. Because if you're thinking about flags, you're not thinking about modules, you're not thinking about architecture, you're just thinking in terms of minus E, minus D. It, it, it's a mess, it has no sense. There is no way for you to try to reason about it and think about, all right, am I including this stuff? Uh, is there like a good reason for it? Or am I just, I don't know, grabbing things that I should not, uh, things that maybe depend on me while I'm depending on them. How, how can you know? How can you tell? Personally, I can't. The other way around, if you just declare modules, if you just say, I have like lib B and it depends on lib A, even if you scale that to like 100 or 1000 module, I mean, every intern at your company can take that, do a grep, output that in the dot file, and just draw you the graph. And I'm pretty sure it's easy to write uh, some kind of sanitizer or a check tool that you can run on your, on your git, git commit or on your pull request to tell you, all right, you've introduced a circular dependency, you cannot do that. If you reason in terms of modules, it just become a graph. If you reason in terms of a huge list of flags, well, you can't do anything, you're stuck. So, the idea behind a, modular, uh, a modern build system is simply to uh, protect you from for, uh, for, for, for circular dependencies, or at least tell you when you're doing it, you might, no, I don't think you could have a good reason, but some of them will let you override that if you really need to. Of course, like I said, the idea is that you can reason at module level. Really, not talk about flags. And basically, it means that the build system is doing more than when you're telling him. It's not just a script file that's doing blindly what you're telling him like a dumb robot. It is trying to make meaning on what you're building and say, hey, 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 hey I, I, I'm not in your place, but if I were you, I would not do that. I, I'm pretty sure you're not doing what you should be doing. The same way your compiler can tell you, when, even if it doesn't stop you, that you are returning, I don't know, the address of a local variable or something else that in 99% of the case is a bad pattern and that you should avoid. So in practice, how does it work? It's simple. Each module will define, of course, the build flags it needs because, well, you have to define them somewhere. They're not, gonna, uh, they're not gonna, going away. They're just localized. You just tell, all right, this is my, my, my module. This is what it needs to build. Then you say, all right, this is what I require. This is the dependencies I use but you, you talk about dependency, you don't talk about flags. 
you do not look at the over modules internal. That's not your concern. You just say, I want libb, give me the flags I need to compile and link with libb. With lib I will do not look at the, at, at the build file and say, okay, in that case, I may need to put that flag because I'm using that feature. That's, that's not maintainable. Of course, you need to uh, split your uh, own build flags in two sets, uh, private and public. That's exactly like the object concern of, uh, of implementation versus interface. Uh, your uh, private flags is your implementation. The flags that you need to build but once you're built, you can throw that away, nobody cares. You just needed that to, uh, to, to get a binary. The second set is the public ones. It's like your public includes, the defined that will uh, affect your, uh, your compilation, uh, all that stuff. And that your clients will also need to be able to compile. And of course, the interfaces of transitive. Uh, that means that if you have a private dependency, uh, you take their modules, but then it stops. If you have a public dependency, it adds to your public interface. For example, if we look at what we, we had in previous example with TCP, HTTP, and, and REST, uh, it's all public dependencies, so the flags have to be repeated at each step. If that was a private dependency, it would stop at the first consumer, because he needs them to build, but then since it's private, it's not seen by the rest of the world, the rest of the world does not need to have those flags to build successfully. And of course, you still have flags. I mean, you have a restricted set of flags. You only care about the flags you will use in your module, but you can still put them, all the ones you, you still used in the past, you can still have them. And I'm not telling you to stop using flags at all. You, you still need them. I mean, uh, this minus E, this minus, uh, minus uh, W, whatever, you still need them. But you need to localize them. You need to make sure that it does not escape your CMake file. So all that is nice, but how, how about CMake, right? Uh, that, that's nice, I show you something that's taken from like Fiori, like maybe some, uh, some, some nice system that's, uh, that, that's going on at another company, but you, you, are, you, you are using CMake, I am using CMake, I'm publishing stuff on GitHub, can I use that with CMake? And I would not be here if the answer was not yes, you can. There is actually an answer. What's the idea? The idea is simple, really. Uh, well, you still use the uh, old add library, uh, add executable, that, that part is still the same. The, I, I didn't have your familiarity with CMake, but I, I hope that everybody is clear on that so far. Okay, great. Uh, and then, every time you have to put some flag, you use the target variant of uh, whatever you, uh, you, you need to uh, set some flags. I, I will give some details after that. Uh, then, if you want to declare dependencies, you use target link libraries. It's half fully named. Because uh, if you want to link with like the, a direct library with a path, and if you want to link with a, a module, with a project, and take its, uh, its interface, it's the same syntax. It, it, it's, it's really a limitation of CMake. I, I, would, I wish there was another keyword so that you can distinguish between these two. There's not. So yeah, it's called target link libraries, but in practice, you're not just telling me CMake that you want to link to a library. You're telling CMake, I'm using that dependency. Please give me all the flags I need to build successfully. And of course, every time you have to specify a property for your files or your build files, you say if it's public or private. Let's see an example. Okay, first part is easy. You start by requiring uh, at least, uh, well, technically you could put 2.8.12, but I think 3.0 uh, is not something too big to ask for most of, uh, of the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's five uh, years old now. Uh, you should be fine with that. Of course, you can go crazy. You can ask 3.9 if you want. Uh, I, I won't stop you. On the contrary, there are lots of interesting features in that. But at least 3.0. Then, well, First uh, counterexample, you might still uh, declare some uh, flags at, uh, at the top level. Why? Well, that comes from my experience. 
And in my experience, there are some kind of compilation flags that you do not want to localize for some particular module. You want to put them everywhere. And the most important is anything that's a combination of W error and W something. Because there is nothing worse than changing your code and having it break because in your header, there is something that will not compile in one of your clients because he has, he's more strict than you. I don't know if it happened to you guys, but it happened to me a lot of time, and that's very painful. So I said that some flags might still be better off at the top level to make sure that all the project is on the same page. And I would ask the same thing for anything that uh, affects the ABI, like a standard level or uh, that kind of thing, because uh, if not, you will get some uh, incompatibilities. All right. Then you still uh, do your art library, nothing fancy here, the same thing you've been doing for, I don't know how much you've been using CMake, but that part doesn't change. All right, and now we come to the, the meat of the thing. Uh, first, you want to declare some public headers. So you say, all right, uh, target include directories, you say it's public, and you give the path. That tells CMake, all right, in the build interface of my, of my project, Anybody who wants to use my project will need this include directory to find my headers. If you have some public headers, uh, for example, in your SRC directory, you just add uh, the same thing with private. You'll be able to include them in your project. Anybody else won't see them. If you have some settings, something that depends on the config of CMake, whatever, you can also put them with the compile definition or whatever. In this case, it's a public setting, but if it would have been a, a private setting, you would just have said private instead. That's the same idea. Uh, if you want, if the, if the setting uh, will have an impact on your public headers, like change the size of a structure or maybe hide some declarations, you need to make that public. If it's only internal detail, like I'm gonna use uh, this algorithm internally or that algorithm and that, that doesn't change your API or your implementation, your public implementation, you can put it private, it's fine. And of course, then you have to declare your dependency. And again, I'm sad that there is not a special keyword uh, that's uh, different from the old one to express that. But trust me in that, if I say target link library something uh, ABC, and ABC is a project, I will get all the public uh, flags that are declared, I will get the link flags I need, and that's recursive. If I need uh, transitively some, uh, some include flags some, uh, or some uh, link flags, I will get them. It will even go across static libraries because as you already know, I think, static libraries are not linked. Uh, so if you have a dependency inside a static library, CMake will remember that and the first uh, shared library or executable that it encounters will link to it. It's taken care of for you. And of course, if you have a private dependency, like uh, something that your implementation relies on, but it's not visible for your headers, you can put it private. It will work too. And it will not be seen by your consumers. Meaning that, for example, if you use Boost, but if you do not want the rest of the world to see Boost, or if you want to make sure that the rest of the world will not use Boost unless it's declared, you make it private. And only people with explicit reference to it will see it. And, and that's a huge point, because what happened a lot in my experience is that everything that can be found through auto-completion inside your IDE will get used by people, even if it's not publicly declared, but it's available through tra transitive dependencies. So the less you have in your public, AP, uh, in your public interface, the, the, the more private you got, you're sure that people will have to be explicit about them and you reduce the risk that your architecture will start to go bad, like I said in the first uh, slide. If you got a header only libraries, which is kind of the fashion today, uh, you can simply uh, declare an interface library. Uh, interface is a, a, a peculiar keyword in, a, in CMake that tells it that something belongs to your, uh, to your, public, uh, to your public interface, but should not be used to build your library, of course, because it's, it's, it's a header only, you have nothing to build. So if you have nothing to build, but you want your clients to see it, 
uh, you make it interface. And you can even link to something. You can say, for example, uh, my, uh, my header only libraries will need this client to be linked to that. You can, you can add a, a, a link dependency, it will work. CMake will take care of everything. Because that may happen. You may have a, 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 a header only libraries that needs something that's not header only. It will work. Like I said, nothing to build, think interface. Now that we, we've seen most of the good patterns, uh, I, I want to take just a few seconds to uh, recognize the anti patterns, the, the bad things. That's the kind of thing when you open a CMake list that tells you that you probably need to uh, rewrite it a bit. So of course, everything that affects all targets, like uh, include directories, add definition, leak libraries, those kind of things are evil. If you put them on your top level, everybody in the world will be able to use them. Everybody in the world will be able to include that headers. And if for some reason the code does not require a link, like for example, header-only libraries or inline, templates, whatever, you will not even get a compiler. People will start creating hidden dependencies through other modules, and they will not even see them. Of course, link libraries, uh, I think CMake have, have, have told people like for 10 years now to stop using it because it just means every project in the world should link that. Uh, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure anybody in this room will be using this, but just in case, don't. Okay, uh, then, uh, yeah? Yeah, 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 I know, only the targets and the, you declare in this file and all the subdirectories you include. Unless you start a new project. Uh, I, I will not, well, I, I will not say it's okay to use in any, at any point because uh, they will not affect your interface at all. So if you declare any include directory, for example, that, you, that your clients will also need because, uh, for example, they appear in your headers, they will have to copy-paste that also to be able to work. I, I really not recommend using that at all. Well, I, I will be happy to discuss that uh, with you afterwards because, frankly, i not seen them uh, in my career. Uh, maybe for very small project, or just like, you know, the tests or something, for, for that, yeah, but for a huge application, uh, that's coming to bite me. In, uh, at some point. And I will get exactly the same, uh, the, the same warning against using target include directories to include anything outside your project. Because if you in include something outside your library, well, you, you, you're, you're breaking the rules again. You're not trying to use a dependency. You're trying to use headers from somebody. You're trying to pull something that's not yours to use it without declaring explicitly I have a dependency to that module. And then you're breaking the rules of talking about modules instead of talking about implementation. And that's the thing here. What, what I encourage you to do is to declare dependencies to modules, not build flags, because it's awful to reason about at scale. Um, since target link libraries is an old macros, and since CMake did not make a new one, you can forget to put public, private, or interface, and it will work. Which one of the three it will do if you do not put public, private, or interface? To be honest, I can't tell you without looking at the doc. So my recommendation is do not use it. Just always tell if it's public, private, or interface. And of course, um, target compile option, I would you recommend you to use caution, because if you put like I said, some W error, you might uh, have surprises because your dependency change and they do not have the same uh, level of pedantic uh, as you do. Or maybe simply you do not use the same ABI, like I don't know, you ask for C++11 and for some reason another library has for C++03, you do not use the same runtime, you're gonna get into trouble. So I would keep that at top level. All right, if you remember this, I think you get like maybe 90% of, uh, of, of what I call modern CMake because 
you started working with, uh, you, 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 you got away from the flags, you got away from, the, from, from looking at the bits and the implementation of other modules, and you move to uh, another layer of abstraction. You're really thinking in terms of modules, in terms of what is my implementation, what are the interfaces I use. You do not care about how people implement their modules. Because another problem is that if they change, you have to change too, Un unless you declare a dependency, and then the build system does that for you. And that's the whole point. And since we have some time, uh, I guess we could talk about the rest, because of course the 10 last percent uh, are le least used, but might still come handy to you. Um, the first example, and I think the, the, the most common case that I did not address yet, is external dependencies. Because we all use third parties, I think, or most of us use third parties, and well, they are not always built with CMake, or not always built with that instance of CMake you're running at, the, at some point. So you have to uh, grab some packages. Uh, for example, here I needed gtest. Uh, I read the doc about the find package of gtest, which said that uh, gtest should be built with threads because on some platforms, uh, on some compilers, you need to link with threads too. So I require also the thread packages. Um, then I create my executable. And since gtest provide me some nice macro, I can uh, add the gtest include here to my directories, and I can uh, link to gtest. And that's wrong. Yeah, that was, a, that was a trap. Yeah, the problem is that you are falling back to the old flags approach. You are not selling, telling CMake that you are depending on gtest. You are telling CMake that you want to include gtest headers, that you want to link to gtest, and that you want to link to gtest dependencies. And should that change, you have to rewrite your code. And fortunately for you, CMake uh, heard that, CMake saw that, and in the most recent, in the, in the recent versions, they, add, they, they, they changed their finders uh, to be able to export targets too. So now, uh, if you take at least uh, 3.5, for example, with gtest, you can just say, all right, I um, require gtest gtest, which is the, the name of the, of the and gtest main, uh, if you want to, to gtest to generate the main function for you. And that's all. That's done. Uh, it will require threads for you if you need them. If gtest implementation completely changed tomorrow and requires something else, it will also take care of it. You will not have to change anything. Um, there has been some effort, like I said, in, uh, in CMake to, uh, to add some new finders. The first one was OpenSSL in 3.4. Yeah, that took four releases to, uh, to think that uh, third parties was a, were an issue, but we are getting there. Uh, 3.5 was big, we got Boost, we got GTest, so already I guess like half the dependency I require on a new project are there. Uh, you got uh, some graphical libraries. 3.6 bring us PKJ config, which is pretty nice because it's not just find PKJ config, it's like if you use uh, CMake to, to find a PC file, it would automatically translate that into a CMake uh, project definition for you. So you can just say, okay, I require that, uh, that PC uh, dependency, you're all set. Any uh, PKJ config uh, package installed on your system, you can require it with modern CMake just with that patch, which is, I think, pretty cool, at least on Unix. The, the only problem is that I never seen anybody using PC on Windows, so that's not exactly portable, but, well, on some environment, that might really be handy. And more recent version, we had OpenGL, OpenCL, BZIP, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, if your manager uh, is a, a bit uh, old on, uh, on CMake, if your infrastructure is a bit old, all the more reason to you to ask him to, uh, to move to a more recent version. You have all the finders set up for you, and that will uh, simplify uh, your code. But what happens if there is none? Because as you have seen, there are some of them, but I don't think that's the whole C++ uh, package community here. Well, I think some, some of them may be missing. So what do you do? Well, first option, obviously, you can just contact the maintainer and ask him nicely to provide one. You may or may not have some results. You may also have some arguments. For example, you can tell him, as I can tell you today, 
that if he builds his package with CMake, he just has to add a few instructions at the end to ask CMake to generate that finder for him. Because when you do make install with CMake, you can also tell CMake to generate a .CMake file that will act as a finder. Uh, I think Daniel Pfeiffer did a, a nice uh, talk uh, on this and, and a lot of other things on CMake at, uh, at uh, C++ now, uh, back in, uh, in, uh, in spring. And it explains uh, all of that. Of course, if you are publishing a library, I encourage you to do one, even if it's not with CMake. If it's with CMake, it's simple, really. You just have two instructions and it generates that for them for you. If it's not CMake, well, let's see. It's not that hard. What do I have to do? Well, first of all, of course, I have to do find library to find the library to, to just make sure that it's installed on the system. And, and CMake will take care of the, of the question that is, is it Windows or Unix? Do I have to, uh, to have a dot DLL or dot SO or dot lib depending on the platform? Um, you can tell uh, CMake that you add the library as an imported target. Uh, and then you say, all right, I want to uh, include those directories and, 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 this, uh, and these dependencies, and I have a nice build interface with an external project. Easy. Well, almost too easy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I hoped that, that by writing that, uh, that, that would have worked, but, but it didn't. Uh, turns out that CMake maintainer le le left me a, a little surprise in that, and that it's a bit more complex. Um, for internal reasons, you cannot uh, use target whatever on uh, an imported target. Doesn't work. The CMake will throw you out. Unfortunately, fortunately, it's only a wrapper. The target whatever is just a wrapper. It's just telling CMake go to the list of variables that are uh, defined in my uh, package and set some values. So you can do it by hand. I won't say it's pretty, like you can see, but it does the job. Simply, you, well, you still add your library. Uh, you have to set a property for the location. You cannot directly tell that when you add the library, but you can, you can just set property. and. Same thing, uh, all the, uh, the, the things you, you set like uh, uh, public or private or whatever, it's just a set of variables that's, uh, that's added to your project. That's how it works with CMake behind the scenes. And that's not even uh, relying on implementation details. That, that's something you can find in the CMake doc. Uh, that's not something I recommend you to use, but in this case, you don't have a choice, unfortunately, until maybe CMake patches that. But, well, okay, it's not, Pretty, but it fits on one slide. So, well, that's not that uh, terrible. Can we have easier alternatives? Well, yeah, yeah, there are some. There are some, but as some uh, French uh, famous mathematician said, uh, it doesn't fit uh, on the margin of this talk. So I won't be able to, uh, to give you all the details. Uh, still, like I said before, uh, Daniel Pfeiffer did a very nice talk about CMake, uh, which is called Effective CMake, I think. Yeah, effective CMake. Uh, it was in Aspen, uh, C++ now. It explains lots of things about CMake, uh, from generating finders to uh, using uh, CMake to set uh, some uh, compatibility flag for you, checking the standard support, whatever, you name it, it's got it. it I think it was voted, voted like most helpful talk of the, of the of the whole uh, the whole uh, convention, so I really encourage you if you if you're into CMake, if you have to use CMake, just go look at it. You, you will see lots of uh, interesting things. All right. Uh, so to summarize a bit what we've seen uh, today together. First things, what's modern build? Modern build is about keeping your flags to yourself. Do not try to uh, expose uh, your flags uh, in the code of the others. Do not look at the code to, of the others to try to get the flags. Just keep that to yourself. It, it's your private bit, it's your problem. CMake will handle the rest. You think in terms of modules, really. You, you think about a graph. You know, it's, it's easier when you think about it. It's just like take a whiteboard and do some architecture like we all like to do when we start a project 
and then we fall back into flags because we are out of time. But the idea is that with that, you can still do that uh, the whole time, uh, the whole life of your project. You can always go back to, all right, let's put that on a whiteboard, let's make a, 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 a nice dot file or whatever, and see, okay, is, does that architecture make sense? Or am I trying to, uh, to, to, do, uh, to insert circular dependencies or hidden dependencies? And all the rest, all the transitivity, all the hidden uh, inter flags that you need to pull, you let the build system do that. Again, I'm talking about CMake here, but I don't know what you use at home. Anything should be able to handle that. If not, I guess it's time for a feature request. So for CMake, first of all, take three dot something. The, 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 the most recent, the better, as you might see, as you have seen, there are some nice finders to this. Uh, use the target something uh, alternative uh, for macros. Uh, unless we are talking maybe about compile option, but other than that, use the target uh, alternative. Always specify if a property is public private or interface. You are trying to expose something to CMake, it needs to know uh, the level of uh, visibility, the same way that when you put something in a class, you have to wonder about, is it public, private, or, 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 uh, or, or well, it's not protected in that case, but is it public, private, or both? And of course, you have to link against the target to get all these properties. It's Still not pretty. I would gladly like to have like, I don't know, target uh, require module or something that sounds more like effectively what we are doing, but it's what it will do behind the scenes. It's not just I want to do minus L that library. It's more than that and it's what you should do. For external packages, well, your first option is simply to uh, use uh, modern finders because some of, some of them are provided. If not, write them, ask the manager to write them, or uh, if you cannot, well, there are some options. Like, like I said, CMake can generate one from you just by the build definition of your project when you run the configure and the make install. It can do that for you. If it's an external system, you can ask the maintainer, please, 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 could you use, uh, uh, could you write a finder for CMake for me? If it's a PC file, it's automatic. And if none of that is possible, well, I guess you can try a package manager. All right, thank you all for, uh, for coming, and I think we have like a bit less than 15 minutes for questions, so. <laughs> we have two mix. Uh, I think it would be better for the audio if you can uh, come down and... Uh... Yeah, so, uh, one pain point for us has been uh, some of the fine packages that return uh, hard paths for the library, and then if it gets uh, built somewhere else as part of a different build closure, that path is now wrong due to things like Simlink farms. So. <clears throat> like OpenSSL is at some point been an offender in this. So how would you recommend us be able to take advantage of dynamic libraries like that without breaking the build further down? Well, uh, I, I'm not sure I get that because when, when you run find library, it, it tries to look for a file. So uh, it, it should not uh, return if, it, if it's not found. Uh, you know, you can have the required and when you do find package, you can tell required and if the finder fails because the library isn't there, it will stop. I don't know if it's that's your problem. Uh, so say you had uh, two libraries, the first one got built against OpenSSL, yeah. and it had the hardened, it had the actual link on the ho path to the host for OpenSSL that you linked against. And then it goes off to another section in your build fleet, there's another large section of Simlink farms that are built, that path is no longer the same. So when you go to link against um, project A, the path no longer works and you have linker errors. Uh, you're talking about two different instances of CMake here, right? 
Like you, you, you do first run of CMake, you produce some libraries that have some dependencies, and then you import them into another CMake instance. Mm -hmm. Well, I would tell you that's what package manager are for. Uh, really, I, 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 I would uh, suggest you to, to look at what, what, what exists and, and check with that because doing that by hand on the same machine is possible because you can, uh, you know, you can use submodules in CMake and have everything in the same place. But if you build in different stages, I really encourage you to look at package managers because it, it, if it's just one step, it's possible, but as you, you, you illustrate, if it's a few steps, uh, it gets a nightmare to, to, uh, to handle recursively. And the easier way, if you want to make sure that you keep everything and that the package are really cutable, it's much easier to do with a package manager. Okay, thank you. Uh, you said uh, something about keep your uh, compiler flags to yourself. I cannot uh, appreciate that. I mean, that is, that is a complete, um, such, such truth, because a couple of weeks ago, we have a, we have a whole bunch of um, external libraries, and a couple of weeks ago, we upgraded one of them. And unfortunately, in one of their latest, uh, their most recent version, they have a compiler settings file in which they have declared their compiler flags as public. Now that, what, so I built the externals and tried to build uh, our code base and they had F no exceptions in there. Yeah. And so uh, the, the, our solution, I mean, uh, my quick and dirty solution was uh, go to the compiler settings.txt and do a CMake string replace all of it except no exceptions and replace them with empty yeah, strings. Yeah. That was uh, ugly, I know, but it, is there a better way to do that? Well, uh, my suggestion would be that first, if possible, do not set uh, inside the CMake list, do not set compiler flags. Uh, I mean, do not set like minus std. You can require, you can like as CMake, is this compiler with the flags you've been, I've been supplied able to use C++ 14 or whatever? That's okay, you can make checks. But I think you should not try to set things. It should be delegated to the invocation of CMake when you can do minus D, uh, CMake, CXS flags, etc. And then you can have a profile that you use to invoke CMake, but that should be external. I don't think you should store inside your CMake list flags that define the ABI, the binary compatibility, because your, your, of, of course, two libraries will have their own set of flags and they will disagree and it won't work. It should be possible, it should take something external, some external input, to know uh, what kind of runtime or what kind of minus, minus STD uh, it should be compiled with. It should just make checks. Okay, is it possible with the environment you supply me to build or not, and, and fail if you cannot, but not try to hijack the process and decide that you will change the way it was supposed to be built. So the ex external uh, library itself builds fine, uh, So and we built that with their own flags, but since we did find package on that, I think the flags leaked into into our yeah. build. Uh, that could be the, that could be this. Uh, if, if some public flags are like I don't know uh, some minus d. Uh, that, that's what I said when I said do not use compile flags uh, inside. Uh, do not set compile flags in targets. For me, compile flags that are very platform uh, and infrastructure. It, it belongs to a profile that should be shared by every CMake project you build in the same environment. You should not keep that inside CMake. I think it's a bad idea. You just, you're just setting up yourself for disaster. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi. So uh, could you go back to your, dem your example of using boost through the target? Uh, yep. Uh, so, uh, you know, I own an open source library. I think library. I can, yeah, there is one Perfect. here. Right, so I, so I own an open source library and I recently wanted to upgrade to use modern CMake and so I switched to using the targets created by the find boost uh, script that comes in the box with CMake. Yeah. Uh, then I updated my boost version to the latest boost version the day after it came out, and then my library didn't work anymore because CMake refused to generate targets for the latest boost because it does not know, my, under, my belief is that it's because it doesn't know the dependency information between the boost libraries, and so it doesn't feel confident in creating all of the targets because it doesn't know the relationship between them. Uh, okay, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and, then it, and then I have to wait until another update for CMake to come out to, in order to correct that, but of course that means that I have a two week delay where no one in can that. use my library. However, if I simply directly use the old variables again, it works fine. 
Oh. Well, are you aware of anything that they are doing yeah, to address well, this problem? Uh, I mean, that's, that's something that's completely uh, tied to the fact that the CMake provides the finder for you and that it's decoupled from the version of Boost. Uh, they provide that as a convenience because at the time uh, where the other packages did not. So I think it's, it's more like a, a convenience thing, but that, that comes with the risk that uh, anything, uh, any convenient finder that's given by CMake will not be in line with the latest version of the package. So you would not recommend me do this then? Uh, well, that depends. Uh, if Boost could uh, provide the finder, I would say use that. Uh, I'm not sure they do today uh, because they use their own build system. They do not. So uh, that, that, that's, that's a tough choice, uh, I would agree. Uh, then again, uh, I started working with the guy at Conan because I really believe that package management is the way to solve all that mess. Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm pretty new to CMix, so this might be a really dumb question. But um, if you are you're writing a simple application, you depend on like you depend on libA and you depend on libB, and both of them depend privately on Boost, and like Boost has. I think three different ways you can uh, build it into your project. Which component there, my app or libbay or libb is responsible for kind of, who owns that decision of how are you compiling the library in? Like, or does that depend, I guess, on how your finder is implemented? Ah, okay, uh, well, technically speaking, uh, I would recommend you to do your find, uh, to run the find at the top level of your uh, CMake list, to make sure that you find only one version of every third parties. If you start splitting the finders, you will have two problems. First, you might not require the same version, and you might have like a diamond issue with two different versions like, uh, like it was just shown uh, in this morning uh, talk. The second problem you will have is performance. You, you will not see it with like two libraries, but when I come from, we had at some point a huge code base with CMake, and if everybody in his library, like three or four level down, is doing fine, you're wasting a lot of, uh, of effort, especially because uh, if you use some macros like project, CMake will not cache the results, so it will scan the file system like a million times just to find the same library. So yeah, my recommendation is find at top level all the third parties to make sure that everybody agrees on what you use. Okay, so ideally, the libs that you depend on, all they're saying is find package boost and the responsibility of how you find it and which one you Yeah, you can, uh, you can tell CMake level. when you do a find to require a minimum version. It's possible, and then it will fail if it's not found. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks everyone.